Welcome to the third design workshop in the Geometry and Design series. You might recall that the first two design workshops involved designing a desk and then a bookshelf and a dresser. In this workshop, we're going to refine all three of those designs and probably create a new design as well that um, incorporate curves. So that these are all going to be applications of the curve techniques we've been learning in the past, the curve layout techniques that we've been learning in the past few videos. So for instance, what is projected on the screen now is the plan and front elevation and side elevation views of the desk that we designed back in uh, workshop one. So things that we might be able to change to this is add a rounded profile to the edges of this desktop. Maybe make a SEMA curve transmission or transition to lighten this horizontal stretcher so that it's thinner in the middle but still beefy at the sides where it ties into this, this stretcher. And I was thinking we could do some subtle curves rather than just a straight taper, have a convex curve. Uh, my finger's too fat to really see what's going on with what I mean there, but stay at this width, stay at this thickness, leg thickness at the top, then come down and convexly make a curved transition to this point at the bottom corner. And the way really to think about that is that if we made this whole leg this wide at the top and the bottom so that it was a rectangular profile instead of a tapered profile, and then cut an imaginary rectangle, a real tall skinny one off on the side, we'd be inscribing half of an arc into that tall skinny rectangle, or if you'd prefer an even taller skinny re rectangle is where the full arc would be inscribed. That's a possibility that we might look at. Um, as I've let this design marinate a little bit, I've, I've decided that I'm not really happy with the idea of the drawer in the center and then dead space. I'd rather just make use of the storage. So I might revise this drawer web drawer support structure and uh, put just two side-by-side -side drawers in it and then possibly just design a curved drawer pull that would go on the center of either, either one of those and that would be another opportunity to lay out some curves for this design. In the second workshop we laid out this design of a simple bookcase and it was intentionally simple because and very boxy because it was just going to fit in the space under a loft bed that I'm planning to build for uh, each of my daughters. And um, since we've already got this design in place, we can use it as an opportunity for refinement, even though I'm probably still going to pursue a pretty simple boxy design for the piece that I actually build. And so we can use this case as an opportunity to include some molding on the top, some crown molding on the top, and have some baseboard molding on the bottom, and um, lay out what those molding profiles would look like. So this would be an opportunity to take a pretty boxy structure and just refine it a little bit with some slightly curved design elements. The same could be said for this dresser. Again, it was a boxy design on purpose, but the basic bones of this dresser could form the basis of a far more refined piece of furniture um, with its own top, its own crown molding, um, maybe even some carved, geometrically carved relief curves in some of the drawers. I don't know, we'll see when we get to it. And so, the desk had the opportunity to become more of an organic form with some curves and 
the these two pieces of casework, the uh, chest of drawers, the you know the dresser, and the bookshelf would probably stay to having a fairly classical look to them, but uh, we'll see just what the impact of just a few pieces of molding can have visually on a design. The final thing that we might do is design a much more modern bookcase that would be, you know, it'd be used in a more of a common area like a living room or, or some, some regularly used space like that. And it would be a fairly modern open design for a bookcase that incorporated some Gothic or Lancet arches in the framing that supports the shelves. So we'll, we'll, we'll probably conclude our workshop with how you could lay out a design like that. We'll just see where they go. So without any more delay, we'll get some, a clean piece of paper on the desktop here and we'll get started. I'll probably do some of the initial layout. I'll start with the desk. I'll do some of the initial layout off camera where I just lay the bounding boxes for that desk out. And, um, when I'm ready to start laying out the individual components and um, constructing some of the curved elements, I'll start recording again. So I've laid out most of the um, large scale proportions and bounding boxes. Um, and I've marked locations of some of the legs and stretchers uh, without getting into where any of the curves are going to be yet. I've also included a set of vertical and horizontal scales, all related to a single module. This module is one, um, one eighth of the height, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight. And every, every other dimension will be represented as a a fractional part or a multiple of that module. Though everything's going to be proportional to um, with that module as the basic unit of measurement. So um, what's here so far? I've got the 12 to eight or three to two width to, width to height uh, ratio bounding box for the front elevation view, the five to eight depth to height, uh, side elevation view and the 12 to 5 width to depth plan view of the top. And there were a number of things that I was going to do in terms of curves. Let's start with the with the top. I had planned around these corners and rather than just doing kind of the typical thing and rounding those corners off with a quarter of a circular arc, what I've done is I've drawn this X here to denote where the top outside corner of the table leg is going to poke. Well, it's not going to poke through anything, but it would project up through the top because I don't want to relieve so much material that um, that top corner of the leg is unsupported and visible. And remember the top corner of the leg is two thirds of a module in at the top and half of a module in at the bottom. Now, if that's where the center is, what I've done is I've made a mark half a module in on the front and back you probably can't see them because they're just pinholes, but on the front and back edges of this, this tabletop. And on the sides, I've made a mark going in a full module from the front and then from the back. And what those represent is the full module step is going to be the major axis of an ellipse and the half module step will be the minor axis. So rather than using circular arcs to round these corners, I'm going to use quarter of an elliptical arc. Now that's a pretty small picture or small place to draw an ellipse using any of our techniques, whether we use the Steiner projection or 
the string and two nail methods or even the trammel method. Um, it does turn out to be true that I have these ellipse templates and on this particular template the inch and a half ellipse has its major axes and minor axes almost perfectly. It's not, I, not amazing, but it's almost perfectly lining up with my tick marks on this, this tabletop. So I'm going to use that. You now why go to a tedious construction technique if you've got a template? Now that doesn't mean if I were to build this desk, and I might actually, I could use a desk out here in this shop space, especially if I'm going to keep doing work like this out here. That didn't quite go right. I'd rather have a heater before I've got another desk out here though. Oh, that's why that looks wrong, using the wrong ellipse. That's better. I'm going to go in and clean this one up a little bit. I'm not happy with how it lined up. That looks better. Then, just eliminate those old layout lines. That's why I drew them kind of light. And we've got this desktop that has elliptical corners. And on my design, I, I, guess, I guess I lost track of what I was saying there a minute ago. On my design, what I'm going to do is just make a note. that This is an elliptical arc with a major axis. equal to a full module and a minor axis is equal to a half a module. And the reason why I make note of that here is that later on I can come back and when I'm making the full size desk I can go ahead and make myself a template make myself a full size template for marking on the desktop material itself the lines that I'm going to have to cut that ellipse off with. And um, then I'll have a repeatable pattern that I could use. And as long as I know that, you know, at the full scale that I'm trying to get rid uh, or design an ellipse with a major axis of a module, which is one eighth the height of the total desk, um, then I, I should have no problem laying that out on a piece of thin plywood or hardboard um, so that uh, in just using my Steiner projection or using my uh, string method or even using a trammel. So these curves, I will still use my technique to lay, lay them out when I'm at a larger scale and I need the accuracy then but getting the best ellipse off of my little plastic template that I could to fit in that space was fine for the purpose of drawing the, the uh, model because this, or drawing the uh, plans because these plans are a model and this is the information that I need to make that model work at any scale. Okay, so at this point, that's what the desktop looks like. And what I might do is project that transition point from the elliptical curve to the straight edge of the desk down to the elevation views. So we can kind of see that that's where that elliptical curve is going to start. And on the side, I need to come in a full module and I'm already doing that here and here. So we'll just lightly draw that line. I guess I'm covering what I'm doing with my head. It's always tough with overhead filming to keep the 
back of my head out of the screen. Okay, so that, that takes care of the representing the curves on the top of the table and then how they look, you know, when they're transitioning from curve to straight on the front and the sides of the table. So now another place I said I was going to put in some curves was on this big stretcher that connects the two sides, the side leg carriages together and gives this thing some stability. And in the old design, I'll go ahead and lightly pencil it in. This was a, this was a stretcher that was a full module tall. It was a board that was a full module wide and stretched between the two side leg carriages. And what I'm proposing to do on this design is to maybe take half a module, which I think my little compass is set to. We'll step in half a module from the inside of the side legs. And we'll keep that part of this center stretcher at a full module thickness there. But then what I'd like to do is, let's see over here, I've got a module that's divided up into three pieces. And I did that so that I could project down and see where the top of the leg should be, because the top of the leg on this design was a third of a module. So I want to I wanna get two thirds of a module off of this scale. And that's how much of this center stretcher thickness I want to keep in the intermediate parts here. And I'm just going to draw that lightly for the moment. So I want the center stretcher to be this thick in the middle, but I want it to make this transition down here to the full module thickness. So two thirds of a module transitioning to one third of a module, or one full module. But I don't want to make that transition just with a 90 degree turn. I'd like to make it smooth. And what I'd like to do is make that transition over the, oh, you know, I, somewhat arbitrary, but let's maybe, so here we are, we've made a half a module step in, here's another half a module over, and then another full module. So what if we, we made, you know, stepped over what if we made the transition from full module thickness to two thirds of a module thickness over the span of a module and a half, which would mean this is the point where I want to stop. I'm going to do the same thing over here. So here I am half a module in from the inside of the leg, another half module then a full module, that's where I want the center stretcher to be two-thirds of a module thick. And so to make that happen, what I'm really needing to do is take this line segment here, this one here, connects these two points, I'm really just going to draw this one lightly. And I want to replace that segment with just a real graceful SEMA curve. It's convex at the bottom, concave at the top. And um, let's just do a simple one that breaks this curve into two halves. So the joint in that SEMA curve is going to be halfway from one end point to the next, so I'm going to use my dividers to find that midpoint just by stepping. 
almost there. Got to open it a little bit more. Might have gone too much. Nope. Always a little fiddly on these small scales. Try one more time. Okay, so there's the midpoint. And then should be the midpoint on this one too, but yeah, it's close. A little bit of inconsistency on how I connected those dots, I guess. There we go though. There's the midpoint on that one. So I just need to get out my small compass, small marking compass, and I'm going to lay out a SEMA curve that joins those two segments together. And again, it's going to be concave down on this left piece and concave is that what I want to do? No, I want to uh, concave up on this left piece and then concave down on the right piece. So I'm going to start and see what a sixth of an arc looks like on this. And I do that by setting my marking compass to this distance. The distance from the end of the transition zone to the midpoint. I think I've got. And need my center to be up here. Let's see how that looks. So I can see that it's probably a little hard to see on your screen, but I can see that a sixth of an arc is too much because what's happening is that it is bulging down below this distance, below what would have ordinarily been the, the thickness of this, or the width of this board. So what I'd actually like to do then is um, probably, I'm gonna just double that radius, so, which means I'm gonna take the full distance between the endpoints of not the half segment, but the full segment and I'm going to use that as the radius. So I'm taking this distance. And I'm going to use that as the radius of this arc that spans through half of my segment. So that's one of the, it's kind of like an approximation to a twelfth of a arc. It's not exact, but you know, it's pretty close. And then I'm going to use that same distance here yeah. and that, that works reasonably well and I'm going to do those over here too so this one is the one that needs to be down here. I don't like that, I missed. Must have missed. Yeah, that's better. This is a pretty cheap compass, so it's actually moving on me and not giving me the best arcs. There we go. And then I'm just going to darken darken that stretcher. So it's kind of like a not really a cloud lift, but it's it's um, um, it relieves that that massiveness that we saw on the center 
horizontal stretcher uh, in the in the uh, front elevation view, and uh, just lightens the overall design of this this desk, and think it'll make it look a little bit more graceful than the blocky nature that we saw in the first pass of this. Okay. Well, we just laid out the SEMA curve transition from the full module width of the large horizontal stretcher at either end to the two-thirds module width in the interior part of that, that stretcher. And at that small of a scale for the, the front elevation view of the overall drawing of the desk, there was really nothing else to do but just to fiddle around with uh, fiddle around with um, drawing arcs of different radii from our um, practical scale of arcs and trying to get them so that they smoothly made the transition from a horizontal tangent at the full module width at the base of the stretcher up to the midway, you know, making a convex curve up to the midway uh, point across this transition zone, then to making a concave cur down curve that went to the two-thirds width part of our stretcher at the end of the transition zone. And ideally that would come in at a horizontal tangent so that it doesn't bulge up above and make any part of this stretcher less than two-thirds of a module. And also, if it's coming in too slow, then it's going to make a sharp kink at this point of transition here. And so, at the scale that we drew it, it probably looked pretty close. But I wanted to show you how you could lay that curve out carefully at a larger scale, or even at full scale, if you were wanting to make a template. And what I've drawn here is probably a little bit larger than full scale, and I'm do just doing that so that we can see it on, on uh, the camera. So here's what's going on in this picture, what I, I just did off camera. This is the end of the stretcher, where it would have butted up into the side stretchers. So this is a full module wide. And then I came in half a module to where the transition zone was going to start. And then a module and a half later, I'd get to the point where that stretcher is only two-thirds of a module high or wide. So what we did on the um, drawing of the full front elevation view was basically we just imagined connecting this left end of the transition zone to this top end of the transition zone with a line segment, which we then bisected. And then on each of these half segments, we played with different um, compass radii to get an arc that looked like it was, you know, doing roughly our, our, the kind of transition that we wanted. And then use that same one to get a curve that looked, well, that doesn't look good at all, but get a curve that made the smooth transition into the a horizontal tangent here as well. And then they shared a common tangent here. Well, Here's how you could find the centers for those arcs if you were trying to create a template for laying out this smooth SEMA curve accurately on both ends of the stretcher so then that you could, you could cut it carefully. Since there's going to have to be a horizontal tangent of that circular arc here, the radius of the arc at this point has to be perpendicular to that horizontal tangent. So somewhere along this line that I've drawn with a layout square to ensure that it is 90 degree, making a 98 degree angle with the bottom edge of this, this stretcher, somewhere along this line we're going to have to have uh, the center located. Well, the way that we find that center is that we just take this half segment, find its midpoint and then its perpendicular bisector and project that perpendicular bisector to wherever it intersects with this radial line here. And then once we've found that, take the biggest compass you can find in this case, put it at that center, and then put the marking tip 
down here at the starting point of the transition zone and then just swing the arc to the midpoint in the transition zone. Let's see if I can make this somewhat visible. We stop at that midpoint. Now, I'm a little bit, um, well, maybe I can do the same trick that I did the other day where I made myself a temporary desk. Um, I don't have enough room. Oh, I just also messed up my compass, I think. Double check the setting. Yeah, these things are pretty sensitive, so if you bump them, you really ought to take the time to reset them if you're trying to repeat an arc. Now the problem I've got here is that if I'm trying to draw a concave down curve to connect these points, the center is going to be off screen in this direction somewhere. So I'm going to try to see if I can make it work by supporting a surface under my desktop and I'm just going to swing arcs down here and try to find it. If you were doing this on a template, I would just, if you were trying to make your own template here, I would just do what I'm doing on a big flat surface like a dining room table or something and leave yourself plenty of room to find your centers. But my, my center is off screen, but I still got it to work. And so what I did is that I just took this compass, this big compass that I've got here, that had the correct radius from the concave up arc that I drew over here. And then I swung arcs from this point and this point off screen to create the mirror image of this center down here so that I could draw this curve. And so what that does for me is that it gives me this nice SEMA curve with a very gradual arc, it's a slow arc, that joins the widest part of the stretcher, the full module width part of the stretcher down here with a horizontal tangent line, sweeps through this junction point with a common tangent, and then comes back up with a horizontal tangent line at the two-thirds module width part of the stretcher. And so, we're just using what we know about tangent lines being at right angles to radii of circular arcs in order to figure out how to do that layout. So if this was, this is bigger than, than um, it needs to be, but if this span right here was truly the full width of that central stretcher, then what I could do with this piece of material here is just cut it out, you know, get a pair of scissors and cut this piece of heavy paper out. And then I could just lay it on the edge, on the face of my stretcher board and trace this arc on one end, flip it over to the other side and trace it there as well and get not just the right arc, but get the right arc symmetrically drawn on it. So this goes back to the idea that our um, full view drawings of our front elevation, side elevation, and plan view of the, um, the uh, piece of furniture that we're de designing. They're often going to have fine scale details that are difficult to render um, on those drawings themselves. And so it's not a bad idea to go and make full scale drawings of them elsewhere. And what I mean by full scale is that you would take the actual measurement that you plan for, in this case, the stretcher width to be, and make sure that that measurement matches this dimension that I'm spanning with my thumb and fingers here. Um, because then you could cut it out and use it as a template. And the last curve that we needed to do, and this is again going to be kind of a subtle curve, is that on the old design, um, these the tops of the legs were a third of a module thick and square. The bottoms were half a module thick and square. And it was the inside faces that were 
plumb and square to the rest of the design, but these outside faces were the ones that tapered from the thin part at the top down to the slightly fatter part at the bottom, both on both of the outside faces. And rather than making those straight tapers, we could also make them curved tapers. And um, the problem with that is, you know, actually here, I'll try to, try to illustrate it. It might be just big enough to where we can see what I'm trying to accomplish here. So I'm gonna lightly as possible draw the outside of the leg. So here's the inside of the leg, here's the outside of the leg, this light line that I just drew. I'm doing it light because I want to erase it. And then, that's what the outside of the leg would look like, that second thin line that I just drew from here to here. That would be how the leg would look if the whole thing was a third of a module thick. So this would be the outside edge if the leg was a third of a module thick. This is the outside edge if the leg was a half a module thick. And here's the, the common inside edge. So this narrow strip that I've just drawn is a rectangle. And what I'm really trying to do is imagine that I copied that rectangle and had it up here as well. And what I'd like to do is draw the arc that is inscribed in that rectangle so that it's vertically tangent at this point and tapers down here in a curved way to the fat part. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that. Um, it's just such a wide aspect ratio that I might not be able to lay it out that accurately on this picture. I can try. Um, if I can't do it, one thing I can just do is approximate it. I can say, look, Well, let's see, let's see what we're faced with. We'll try to do it here. So one way of going about doing this is recognizing that this point up at the top where we have the vertical tangent line, well, that's gonna be the center line for our arc. So I've just lightly drawn that off of my paper and uh, you know what, I'll sacrifice my desk. <laughs> Here's a new piece of paper. I'll just kind of tack this down in place with one of my, uh, that's gonna give me another couple of inches. And I'm doing this because I think the center for this arc that I'm hoping I can draw, is gonna be way off to my right here. Probably off the side of my desk where I won't be able to support it, but we'll see what happens. All right. So now I'm going to go back and draw that baseline. That's about where I ran out of desk anyway. I certainly ran out of T-square. All right. Now, one way of finding the center along this center line is to draw a diagonal from the, and I'm not actually gonna draw it, but to draw a diagonal from the apex of my curve. So this is the point where I want the curve to be vertically tangent um, to the uh, vertical dimension in this picture down to this outside corner. So I would draw a straight line there. And then I would try to find the perpendicular bisector to that line. Well, I'm not actually gonna draw that line in order to find its perpendicular bisector because I know all I need to do is between these two points, the top left of this thin strip and the bottom right of this thin strip, I just need to find a double equilateral triangle construction. So if I take you know, one of my bigger compasses and um, boy, I kinda wish I would've sharpen the pencil on this one because I'm going to need as every ounce of accuracy I can get. So I'll go ahead and do that. Put 
back in my compass. Now the other question that we're going to have is that even if I can find the center, am I going to have a compass with enough of a span that I could even mark it? Anyway, so I am going to do my double equilateral triangle construction by setting Setting. I don't know how much of this you're even going to be able to see, but by setting the marking or the uh, pivot tip of my compass at the top left corner of the very thin, tall rectangle and the marking tip at the bottom right, and I'm going to go over here and lightly because I'm going to want to erase that later. Swing an arc. And then I'm going to switch points. Pivot point's going to be on the bottom right corner. Marking point's going to be on the ah, top right. Look for where those arcs intersect. Right down here. And then I need to do the same thing on the other side. So All right. Now... I'm going to take my T-square because that's the... Let's see if I can flex it. And we can see that this is in no way going to work because what I'm doing is that I am marking... I'm laying my T-square against these two intersections that, that form the perpendicular bisector of the slightly tapering line. And I'm trying to project it out to the right to where it's going to intersect with this true horizontal baseline. All right, and we can see that that is going to be a fool's errand because that's probably going to finally intersect six, eight feet out to the right of my desk. There's no way I could support enough paper out there to find that mark accurately. And even if I did, I, don't, I do not have a compass with a eight foot span. So I'd need to make a pair of trammel points and put them on a long beam and swing that arc. And what we're going to find is that, boy, we're, it's going to be almost impossible to tell that we're even dealing with an arc on this page. I might as well freehand it, is really what we're, we're boiling down to. And there's a couple of ways I could do that. I could use a French curve. I could also take this ruler and it's a flexible steel ruler and I'm just putting it on edge so that it's got a slight bow between those points of interest. And that gave me a little bit of an arc. You know, it's going to be hard to tell. Get a darker pencil to do it. It's going to be hard to tell that that is an arc rather than a straight line. So all of this fuss, you might argue, is probably not worth it. But we're just kind of experimenting here, and I'm, I'm actually doing this on purpose to make my next point. All right, so I've used a flexible beam here to attempt to indicate that this is an arc. But, you know, to your eye and probably in, in mine too, that probably looks like a straight line. So this is one of those situations where rather than trying to lay that out totally accurately, we could just indicate that, that is a inscribed arc in half a rectangle. Meaning that if I wanted to get carried away and try to um, lay out that arc carefully on my workpiece, you know, I might be able to do that. But what I would probably do is what I just did with this ruler, except on a larger scale. You know, I periodically I make these little battens of flex 
thin, you know, scrap stock of wood. This is just a cut off of, of maple. You can see that there's this little leather thong floating around on it. And it's, like I said, it's flexible. So on a something like a full size leg, I could bend this so that it just traced out the arc that I wanted. And maybe even cut that out on a template of a piece of cardstock paper or, or even a piece of plywood so that I could mark that arc repeatedly out on the edge of the a leg. And then I would just have to you know, cut that slightly concave taper with a, um, you know, with a shaper or um, I would probably just do it with a hand plane. Um, because I've got a hand plane that's uh, it's called a compass plane that'll curve it'll it'll cut curved uh, concave curved um, recesses on long boards. So enough messing around with these curves. You know, it, if you want, I guess you could continue to take the ruler on edge. This would force me to do it left-handed, so I'm not real happy about that. But you know, honestly, just do. Something like that. I don't know if you saw that, but I was I was moving the ruler slightly as I was drawing. I'll try to do it on these sides as well, so that I pivoted off of this point at the, at the top, and then just kind of gradually as I got down to the bottom, I let my thumb let the ruler slide out to give myself a gentle arc, rather than you know just a straight line. And that you know that works okay. We get slightly tapered looking legs like that. So again, it, these plans, when you're drawing them by hand, they're, you know, they're models. They are meant to be representative of what is going to happen at the full scale. And it's not something that you're going to necessarily blow up, especially if you're drawing it by hand, with a computer. So if you get to a detail that is such a fine scale detail on a plan drawn at this size that it's just not practical to draw, you don't worry about it too much. I mean, draw it as accurately as you can, but make notes like this and this that tell you how to reproduce that design element at scale. All right, so I'm gonna clean up some of these stray marks that I ended up having to draw in my picture to go through that whole discussion. I don't really need any of these intersections anymore. Get rid of the extra piece of paper that really wasn't going to help me that much for the size of arc that I needed, radius of arc that I needed. And there we go. So what's left? We, we really just have the drawer frames, the drawer box design left. And on the original design, I believe, I'm going to actually have to bring it out because I don't remember. Yeah, that's what we did. So we had this stringer on top of the drawer box that was a module quarter module thick, and then under that, the whole drawer box was made up of something that was a, a module thick, but the bottom bit of that was the bottom stringer that supported the drawer box. That was also a, a uh, quarter module. So we've really got five quarters of a, of a module in to total, but the drawer heights themselves are just three quarters of a module. So let's lay that. The way I'll do it is that I'll take my small compass, reset it to a quarter module, on my side scale here, so there's my 
top stringer. My module thickness below that and the bottom quarter of that module represents the bottom stringers. So I'll go ahead and draw those horizontal lines now with, I guess, my T-square. This isn't really going to introduce any curved design elements. So what I might just do for the sake of time for this recording is not really repeat anything with drawers on this. Oh, I've got to go over here too and project this over to the side aprons. There we go. Darken that while I'm here. So what I might just do here is just be expedient about it. So I'm going to project the midpoint upward. And try my best to just eyeball a quarter of a module that is centered over that midpoint. That's probably not too bad. And then that's just going to be a drawer divider for this modification that I told about told you about where I don't want to have a central drawer with just dead space on either side of it. It's kind of a waste of structural space that's available on this thing. Um, I'm going to do two side-by-side -side drawers separated by a divider. And that pretty much incorporates a few subtle curves onto this design. And, oh, um, the one other thing that I needed to represent was I'll just copy it off of this. This is our old design. Remember the, um, how did I do it? Can't remember what I did. One strange. Um, I don't remember how far I projected this in. Looks like maybe I just stepped it, that's what I did. Yeah, I stepped, so this is this end view of this horizontal stretcher on the old design was stepped in half a module from the um, inside of the back leg. So I'll go ahead and do that. So step this in one, two, that's half a, two quarters is a half a module. And then one quarter gives me the thickness of that material that formed that inside stretcher. So, or that, that rear horizontal left to right stretcher. So if I just connect those two dots lightly, this is really just a repeat of stuff that we saw in the older design. Um, and I'm doing those lightly because I'm just going to draw the, the little, and I'm going to freehand these, the little finger tenons that poke through. This was something that we, you know, showed in more detail on that old first pass at this design on a detailed view. I really should have used my T-square. My hands are cold and stuff starting to slip now, so just darken some lines so that you get the final view of what's going on here a little bit more, a little easier for you to see that way. inside of these legs. These two, I guess. And that'll probably be enough. I don't actually 
actually looks all right. Okay, so it is not a massively dramatic difference. It's subtle, but it does change the overall look and feel of the desk. So there's the old view on the right, old views on the right, at least at the front elevation and top view. And some of those subtle curves really lighten up the, uh, the uh, look and feel of this, this desk. So those might be refinements that I end up keeping if I decide to keep that desk. And of course, the side view doesn't really change that much. Um, the main thing is that we'll now see these curved tapers rather than straight tapers on the, uh, the refined version. You can play games with those kinds of curved tapers uh, to make them look more dramatic than they are. And one thing that I've done on the past is I've relieved a chamfer, a facet, on the corners of those legs, and I cut more of a chamfer in the middle section of the leg than I do at the top or the bottom. And so what it causes those chamfers to do is cut in more in the middle than they do at the top, and it gives the illusion of a more dramatic curved taper, curving taper that on that leg than there really is uh, because of the way that, that chamfered facet looks. So anyway, um, that's, that's probably about enough for refinements on this, this tabletop. And, you know, this is just my, my personal um, taste coming through, but with a lot of furniture, I take a less is more approach with adding curved elements. I think if you get too carried away with trying to get very broad, stroking and, and um, dramatic curves into your designs, or if you start throwing things like volutes in just because you want to draw a volute, it's, it can look like overkill. It can uh, it could end up looking kind of gaudy and tacky, and uh, so I try to avoid that. But there are certainly folks out there that are very focused on a classical um, um, style of furniture. Um, or a very modern style of furniture that admits some more dramatic curves. And they do it and they do it well. It's just, it's just not my thing. So that's why you'll see when there's curves in the designs that I do, they're, they're often pretty subtle. So we'll move on to one of the pieces of casework next. Quite a few years ago now, I taught math at the University of Akron. And one spring I was teaching some evening calculus classes and outside the window of the classroom I was using, there was this owl that had gotten a hold of a, of a rabbit and it took its sweet time dispatching that rabbit. And, um, you know, most people probably think of rabbits as being these quiet, docile things, but let me tell you, it puts out the most um, horrendous blood-curdling scream. Um, it, I mean, it, it sounds like a small child being tortured. So, um, to my knowledge, there's no owls in the vicinity tonight, uh, but my sheep sure are agitated about something, and I just can't uh, delay recording any more than I already have. So we get to listen to my fairly useless geriatric sheep braying for whatever it is that's uh, annoying them tonight. So you hear that in the background? Just, just ignore it. I fed them. They should be fine. What you're looking at on the screen now is um, the plans from the previous design workshop that I drafted for the dresser. And these were the no frills plans that had a very boxy shape to them. And the intention is, is they're just going to be under a lofted uh, bed where um, you wouldn't really be able to see much fancy detail if you put it on. That said, this design is pretty sound, uh, at least as a concept. And so for this design workshop, 
I thought we would refine it a little bit, keep its basic structure, but refine it by giving it um, some uh, top like capital structure, some plinth structure with various molding strips, um, give it a little bit of a waist so that we're going to make the, the uh, drawers themselves a little bit narrower. Um, and just see how that ends up looking to make it look a little bit more like a classical piece of furniture. Um, so specifically what I have in mind is taking a, um, maybe about a, remember this, this module here I've divided into one, two, three, four, five, six pieces. If I divided it in uh, those six pieces into halves again, a twelfth of a module would make a pretty good thickness for a top plank on this and probably a decent thickness for the molding strip that would be right under it. I would imagine I would keep uh, three of those those um, twelfths of a module or so for this bottom piece, um, this plinth, but I think I would probably eat up some of the drawer space above it with maybe another strip of molding. And so what that'll effectively do is eat away at some of the vertical space that I have for drawers. And then, like I said, I'll, I, I would imagine that I will actually bring in the sides somewhat so that I don't have as much width in the middle. And it will give, give this more of a classical look with a, a, a waist to it. I have already laid out <laughs> that sheep. I have already laid out the um, the basic vertical spacing of the components that I've got in mind of the the top, the molding strip under it, the plinth, the molding strip on top of that. I've cut out uh, a rectangular area that's going to contain some relief for some feet that this this um, this chest of drawers, this dresser is going to set on. And that's visible both on the front elevation and the side elevation view. But aside from that, I haven't really changed the overall proportions. The width to height ratio is still three to four, or if I want to scale it up so that, or, or so that it's in terms of a common module, six to eight. The, um, Width to depth module is three to six or one to two, and the depth to height ratio is three to eight. And so what that means is that I am using one of these steps here. I'm not sure that showed up. There we go. I'm using one of these steps here as my module. And that what that is is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight parts of the overall height. So that's my common module in this design is um, one eighth of the height. All right, so now at this point, I really just need to start working on how I'm going to uh, refine these spaces. And what I'd like to do is on this top, I'm going to really just freehand it in, but I, I'll, I'll give myself a little bit of layout. My small compass right now is set to one, two, three, four, five, six, or one sixth of this common module. Um, that was one twelfth of the module that was on the previous version of this. So that module was just twice the module that I'm using in this design. It's just same dimensions, it's just going to be more convenient for me to work with. So I'm going to take that step size, which ends up being about an inch in physical dimensions, and I am going to step in by that much, just under the top, And rather than, 
trying to squeeze my small dividers down even smaller than they are, I am just going to eyeball, bisect that really small distance there. And what I would like to do is just imagine an arc slightly asymmetric and convex arc that's going to give me the edge profile on the top of this piece. Now this is where things are going to get kind of hard to see and you're going to have to just bear with me as I freehand this profile. Oh, and I need to do that. I need to do that on the front edge of the side elevation view as well. I'm not going to do it on the back and I'll try to make my reasons for that clear as we progress with this design. Okay, so I've just got an arc, so it's a slightly, it's like an ovalo, upside down ovalo um, profile on the edge of this top. All right, I'm going to step in that remaining half of a twelfth there, and then I'm drawing this lightly because I'm going to refine it. That's going to step in about an inch as well. So what I'm doing is drawing a box that's going to contain the molding profile that sets immediately underneath this, this top. Okay. So how's that going to work? What I'd like to do is just have a slight cove molding. And you know, remember that it, what a cove molding, you know, like in a square might look like. If you've got a, just to blow this up, here's the edge view of this molding that I'm trying to design. So imagine that, you know, maybe I bisect one side of this square into four equal pieces. I know they don't look that equal. Um, if I were just to take that diagonal line and erect a sixth of an arc on it, so there's this fillet that's a quarter of the square on the top, on the top uh, face and the bottom edge. And then when I connect those diagonal pieces, you know, here's, here's kind of what this, this molding that I'm trying to go for looks like. The only problem is, is that I'm trying to draw it in this little tiny square right here. And it really gets to the point where, you know, you can, Pin prick there to divide that space in half. Put another one to divide that top space in half and do the same on the left side there. Same here and here. And I know that's going to be really hard to see and it's going to be even harder to draw, so I better take my little lead pointer here and sharpen things or this is never going to be visible. So what I want to do is kind of draw this line across the top of this molding strip that I'm trying to render. And when I'm done with this, I'm going to draw a blown up view of what that molding profile looks like over here on the side. So we're going to scale it up so that it's a little easier to see. I knew I was going to do that. Broke my point. sharp enough. Okay. I 
I don't know if you can still hear those sheep. I can though. I don't know if they're going to calm down tonight or not. Okay. And so that little thin strip that I drew there is the face of this fillet right here. And then, let's see, I need to divide the bottom of my square in half and then divide the right half of that in half again. And I'll do the same on this bottom half of the square, except a mirror reverse. All I'm going to do is try to freehand the arc that I have in mind. And then Oh, and I'll do that over here too. I know it's hard to see. That's why we're going to do a detailed blown up view of that. So now that I've got that all done, I'm going to darken the bottom parts of this molding profile so that it stands out a little better. Make sure my head's right under the camera. All right. Okay, so now we've laid out kind of a view of a molding there. Okay, now from the outermost edge of my bounding box. I've really just stepped in two of these divisions here, these twelfth of a, or sixth of a module divisions. So I would like to just under, you know, this fillet here, this is where I would like the outside of the drawer case to start moving going to projecting down vertically from there. So that means on this side here, I need to step in two of those, those steps. And I've actually already got scales that mark them. So I think I will just grab my, uh, my layout square. Rather than poking more holes in my paper, I'll just project those up. So here's one, two, and lines up pretty well up here. And that is the new outside of my case of drawers, my chest of drawers or dresser. And the same thing here, I'm gonna step in one, two, you can just barely see the tip of my pencil when I'm doing that, so I'm gonna step in one, two of those sixth of a module steps from the outside. And that will project up to that tiny little fillet at the top. All right, and that becomes the left side of this chest of drawers. Okay, so I need to work out the profiles Oh, I guess I should do the same thing on the front. So, oh, I didn't draw them in, so I will, I made pinholes, but on my scale here, I'll mark one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, and I step two of those in, so one, two. I'm gonna project Fill it at the top down to that distance at the bottom. Okay. And that becomes the new front of my chest of drawers. Okay, so now I need to figure out some sort of a molding profile and a way to smooth out these, you know, this plinth and these feet at the bottom. And One thing that might be kind of nice is to do like a 
reasonably good sized um, ovalo, then a fillet, and then a cove on the molding strip that sits above it. So just to get another stretch of paper, here's Here's that foot, and right now it has this kind of boxy rectangular look to it. And then there's a, this is not gonna be the scale, but there's a strip of molding on top of it. But how do I, you know, how do I bring that in? You know, one thing I could do is um, just above this level here, maybe, I've got a joint and I'm gonna round up and then this molding profile would just be you know uh, a cove there at the top so I've got this kind of asymmetric ovalo maybe almost like an elliptic one or I could do it as a circular arc it wouldn't wouldn't matter, either one would be possible. And then I'd have this strip of molding laying on top of it perhaps that just looks like a reflection of the piece that is sitting under the top. So let's see if we can make that work. Um, what I'd like to do is take this cutaway piece here, project that over to the left of this bottom strip. And in terms of distances, what that is, is that I, I took one sixth of this module and then one half of that. So it's, it's really three twelfths of a module to go from here to here, which lets in this height under the uh, pedestal and above the floor that this thing is sitting on. So I, I'm going to want to take that piece there and maybe come in just one sixth of a module. So to here and do that rounded curve that I was just describing. And I think doing one that's elliptical would make some pretty good sense. Or at least something that's got a vertical tangent line on this outside edge here. Because that way I'm going to come down flush to this line here. And I might decide that I need to drop this line a little bit. We'll, we'll see. In any case, I want to sharpen this lead point a little bit. These weird little sharpeners for these clutch pencils. And get this detail in. So this is, again, this is such a small molding profile. You might as well just freehand it. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to project my lines there's really nothing wrong with freehanding these profiles because they're giving you well it's building a skill for one thing but it's also giving you some idea of what you're shooting for without immediately getting into where you're going to lay the whole thing out. Um, so that once you kind of work out the proportions of your curves, I don't like the way that turned out. Clean that up a little bit. Okay. Put in my it's hard drawing these mirror images, getting them symmetrical, but there, I think I've got it now. Okay, 
So I did, did what I wanted on those. Might as well darken this edge too. There. While I'm at it. All right. And now I want to put just in this space here, just on top of that, that uh, curved set of feet, I want to basically have this little cove molding, but I want to flip it upside down. So what that means is that I need to figure out, need to draw a little fillet line going up here. So I'm going to draw that in lightly and then do it here too. Just at the top of that curve that I freehanded. And just like I did on the top edge of this cove molding under the, uh, that was served as a crown molding under the, the top of the chest, down here I'm going to divide that vertical space in half, and then I'm going to divide the bottom half of it in half again so that I get a quarter. And I'm going to do the same thing on the left side, or the right side. All right, and that allows me to draw in the horizontal line that connects, that represents the fillet that's just a quarter of the way up this one-sixth of a module tall strip. It's real fine, real hard to see on the screen at the scale that you're looking at it. All right, now on the top, I want to have a little fillet step out a quarter of the way across this square from the side of the cabinet, the side of the case. So I do the same thing. I divide this gap in half, and then the space from that midpoint to the wall of the, the chest of drawers, I divide it in half again as well. And that forms my fillet. So I'm going to go ahead and go from the edge of the fillet on the left. I'll darken my line all the way over to the one on the right. And then I just have this, you know, free-handed sixth of an arc. You get pretty good at drawing convincing sixth of, sixth of arcs after you do a few of them with a compass, you just get a feel of what they look like. Then let's go ahead and darken this line now too. Oh, I need to do one of these on the side elevation view as well. All right, so I'll do that. Go over here to the side elevation view. I will try to repeat this process without sticking my head in your view like I'm afraid I've been doing. So divide the vertical step in half, divide the lower half in half again to get a quarter, and I'm going to divide the horizontal step in half, and then divide the half in half again closest to the edge of the, uh, the case. Alright, so... And then I'm going to darken the lines that I want to keep. All right. So there's a lot that I could kind of clean up now. These are just layout lines at this point. I'm going to come back with my erasing shield to get the stuff that's closer to the lines that I want to keep. Probably a little later. All right. I've got a couple more curves to put in place here. I've got... Um, these feet need to make them a little bit more graceful. And what I wanted to do is that I wanted to connect the inside of this notch right here to this point here, which is two modules in from the outermost extremity. 
with an elliptical arc. Then I want to do the same thing over here. Concave down elliptical uh, quarter arc. I want to go from this point over to this point that is two modules in. And I just ended up doing this with my one of my templates. But it's again like we saw with my desk design. This is something that we could um, we could improve upon it at a large scale by figuring out what the major and minor axes are of this ellipse and then constructing that ellipse at full scale to make a template out of maybe a thin piece of plywood or a piece of acrylic. Any of those would be fine. And then use that to lay out the curve on this lower pedestal that we'd eventually have to cut out. Ah, I don't like that. I, think I must have bent my... edge a little bit. There we go. That's a little better. Just kind of blend things in and darken them. Alright, then we can get rid of this notch. Okay. Oh, and I guess I better do that over here as well. This ellipse on my template is a little bit small, so I'm having to kind of fudge it a little bit. And that's why we would you know, go back and at full scale use one of our accurate elliptical techniques. for laying out a cutting template so we can make those arcs repeatedly and consistently. So in order to make our templates for the elliptical curves that we're going to cut out of this pedestal, we'd need to um, we'd need to make note of what the lengths of the major axis and the minor axis are. And when I marked the points that I was stepping or, or fitting my template to here, it's a little easier to see on this one. It ended, that major axis ended up being the major axis ended up being four of those one sixth steps of a module. So four sixths of a module, or reduce it, it's two thirds of a module. And then the height from here to here, I indicated it on this side scale. It was a one sixth of a module plus one twelfth of a module. So that's three twelfths of a module, or, or just a quarter of a module. So the minor axis is one quarter of a module. And that's all we'd need to know in order to lay out that ellipse later on. Now the rest of this design What I'd really need to do with it is um, figure out how much open space I've got left the drawers or to fit the drawers into. And what I thought I would want to do on this one, rather than using a face frame per se on trying to measure a sixth of a module someplace that I haven't ragged out with my compass points. That looks pretty good. So I definitely want the sides of the case to 
be a sixth of a module thick. So that's what I'm going through and marking with my small compass here. And I'm going to lightly draw those in. And so the drawers would span from this point to this point, left to right. Um, what I think might be worth doing, so let's, let's see how far up that goes. So that, that's basically going one, two, three, four-sixths of a module from the floor and really just two modules down from the the um, underside of the cr crown molding for the uh, top. What I think I'd like to do is use up one more module, but I'm going to split it, that module, between the top and the bottom. So I'm going to have a little bit of exposed drawer frame, or shelf framing, cabinet framing. So what I've done is that I've marked a sixth of a module step from the underside of the crown molding down the case line. I'm going to divide that in half. And I'm going to do the same thing at the bottom where I've marked a sixth of a module up. Dividing that in half. And so I would like to have that part of the case visible. So some of that is going to be hidden behind the crown molding here. I'm starting to get too much stuff piled up on my desk. Stash it in the drawers. Out of sight, out of mind. All right. There's that. Twelfth of a module, which basically boils down to a half inch of the case that's showing down here as well. Okay. So, what that means is that we're going to count now. I've got one, two, three from those two halves, four, five, six, seven, seven sixths. So I've got a module and a sixth that's missing from the overall height. If I take the, a module and a sixth of the overall height, then that's what I've got left for overall height inside of this case for my drawer bays, or for, for my bank of drawers. Um, and so it's that distance that I would want to divide up into continuously proportional pieces for drawers. Uh, my drawer heights will not be the same as they were in this design because I um, am eating up a little bit more vertical space here on the bottom and the top. Uh, really, I think, well, I'm probably eating up uh, two-sixths of a, of, a, of a module that I uh, did not eat up here. So I would have to recalculate the spacings for my drawers if I wanted to have one, two, three, four, five drawers that were um, continuously proportional. And, you know, I'm, I might want to continue working with the six to five ratio, or perhaps I want to go with um, uh, something like seven to six. It's a little bit less dramatic of a in increase from the short drawers at the top to the tall drawers at the bottom. Um, this ended up being a pretty deep drawer and that, you know, that's okay, but you, I think since it's a dresser for storing clothes, stuff tends to get buried down at the bottom of something like that. Because uh, these um, one, two, three, 
four steps on this picture. They were about a foot each. So this drawer was close to a foot deep. This was more like six inches. So if I could maybe switch back to a seven to six continuously proportional growth factor for the top drawer down to the bottom, that might might ultimately work better in this, this kind of a design. Since it takes a little while to establish continuously proportional segments, I think I'll probably just do those off camera. Off camera, I drew in the drawer height. These are scaled so that the drawer heights are continuously proportional in a in a six to in a seven to six ratio. from top to bottom. And I think that ended up working out better. I think it'll lead to some more functional drawers. Um, the other thing that I did, did while I was off camera is that I set up a couple of regions here that were scaled up dramatically from what we're seeing over here so that Let's see if I've got the right compass here. I think I do. This distance here, play the compass and the camera so you can see it. This distance here represents, in a blown up view, one of these one sixth module steps. And so in these frames here, what I plan to do is draw the bottom molding profile for the pedestal and the top molding profile for the the um, uh, you, you know the cr the crown molding and the top of the the, the uh, dresser. And so, if you remember, this bottom piece, the pedestal itself, not including the crown molding, came up one, two, three sixth of a um, of a um, module. So that means I'd want to come up one, two, three of those steps. So that mark there is going to be, I'm going to draw a light horizontal line. That is, um, that's going to be the space that's filled by the, the pedestal itself. And then this horizontal strip above it that's one-sixth of a module in height, that's going to be the strip of crown molding. So the other thing to remember is from the midpoint right here, from the midpoint of that pedestal base is where the arc came up to really three twelfths of a module uh, vertically. So from this midpoint up to this point here is the vertical space that this little arc fit in. And the horizontal space was one sixth of a module. So I wanna, I wanna mark that. Here's our one-sixth of a module distance. And pretty well lined up. Come down just so I'm sure that I'm past halfway. And I still need to find the midpoint on this. I, I guess I haven't done that yet. So probably the quickest thing to do is just do a quick double equilateral triangle construction. Drawing light arcs so I can erase them in a minute. Shoot. 
missed. I missed on both of them. Okay. So, lightly prick both of those so I can feel it with the pencil. So, what I'm trying to do then is draw an arc coming up with a vertical tangent line here that comes in up here. And this does not have to be a vertical tangent line up at the top where it comes, or a horizontal tangent line at the top where it comes in. Although I could, you know, if I wanted to, I could make that elliptical and that make, might look kind of nice, but I think just for the sake of expedience, I'm not going to. So, so how would I construct that? Basically, what I need to remember, and I don't know that I'm going to have enough space to the right of my page, so I might have to stick a piece of paper over there. But I'm going to want to have an arc that center is along this line that is made at a right angle with this ver vertical line on my page because that's going to ensure that I've got a vertical tangent line for the arc that's going to be drawn from, he from here to here. So I'm going to lightly draw in that baseline, that center line. All right, now where the center is around here, well, what I'm really trying to do is inscribe half of an arc, half of a circular arc, so that the tangent line is in line with this edge here into this rectangle. So what I could do is just find the perpendicular bisector for this lightly drawn diagonal here. I'm going to draw all these arcs pretty light because I want to erase them when I'm done. Okay. From that intersection to this intersection up here. This perpendicular bisector for my diagonal intersects my center line here, so that must be the center of the arc that I'm trying to draw. So I'm going to put my pivot point for my compass at that center. I'm going to set dia or the ra radius of that compass so that it comes up at this place where I want the tangent line to be vertical. That connects right to the point that I wanted it to. Okay. So now, what am I going to do? I'll um, darken some lines that I want to keep. This right here on down to the bottom. Okay. So that curve right there is this profile right here, just scaled up so that we can actually see what's going on and how it's constructed. All right, now what? Well, I need to, within this one-sixth of a module strip here, that's where I need to build this cove molding. And remember what I did was that profile itself, the co cove profile, fit in this one-sixth of a molding or a, looks like I've drawn it a little bit off. Fits in this square is what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to come on over here and mark out that square. It's off because I'm rushing a little bit, but Okay, get out of the picture here. 
So I'm going to draw this little square. I think I maybe made this thing a little tall is the problem. Yeah. So that top line is a little tall. I'll go ahead and erase that and fix it. profile is going to fit in this square. Remember the way I did it. Let's see if I can find an appropriate compass for this. So my small one would be good if I could. The way I did it, so I took the side of the square, divided it into quarters. Let's speed up the process. Let's set my compass, well, I've already got my compass that's set to that distance. I'm going to put that on the fours. On the line of lines on my sector. And I'm going to set the smaller one between the ones. Not even close. Okay, that got me pretty close. Now I'll step it off to make it precise. One, two, three, four. That was pretty good. All right, so the way this layout worked, so I had a vertical fillet that went a quarter of the way up that square. Then on the top horizontal edge, I had a horizontal fillet that went one quarter of the way in. And then across this segment, I'll just draw lightly in, I drew an arc. And I think I just drew a sixth of an arc that was concave. And I'm going to do that again because I think it looks pretty decent and no sense in getting carried away with getting our visual scale of arcs out and deciding what I want. So I need to draw my arc center up here. Because a one sixth of an arc, you find its center off of the segment that it subtends by doing a equilateral triangle construction. All right, and so there's my Cove. I'll darken the vertical fillet. I'll come up here and darken the horizontal fillet. This is my compasses so I don't poke myself with one of their points. Start bleeding over my work again tonight. That'd be great. All right. And uh, might as well, so that we can see the lines, since this would be a sharp, crisp line on the molding. Draw that in, and then the line at the top of my and that's pretty much what my base is going to look like. Now I still, I don't know. I might still come back and consider getting rid of this circular arc and making it elliptical just because that would be easier for me to have the vertical tangent here and the horizontal tangent at the top just because I think it might make the transition from this piece of molding to this piece of material here a little stronger, but I don't know. I'll think about it. I think for now though, this what I'm trying really just trying to do is demonstrate how after we've kind of thought through what some of these molding profiles ought to look like, 
we just freehanded them in, in a small scale here in, in our, our uh, elevation views. Now I can carefully lay them out and think through, you know, what their construction is going to look like. All right, and then the, you know, the case would go up vertically from there. All right, and so that's that's our profile. That's that's what this thing's going to look like. Now, this other space that I made available up here, that's really just for what does this top look like? What does the crown molding under it look like? Oh, so it's already two of these one six module high pieces. The top was one sixth of a module high. I think I need to make this a little bigger. There we go. One sixth of a module high, but it also stepped in a sixth of a module. So let's go ahead and lightly do that square. That's not true. I forgot. It didn't step in a sixth of a module. It stepped in a twelfth. So which is half of a sixth. I'm just verifying that this compass is a quarter. Yeah, so two steps with this compass gets me to the midpoint. So from this corner up here, the outermost edge of the top down to here is where I want to draw an arc. And again, I think I'll just draw a sixth. And it's going to be convex out that way. So I need to set my compass to the distance between those two points. Top corner of the uh, the uh, material that the top is made out of. And then on the bottom edge, a twelfth of a module in. Okay, so then once I've located those two points, I will locate a third. So that I can draw my six of an arc profile comes down to that piece. And what happens underneath that is that we let's do it my the arc stops. So I'm gonna draw this all the way across. But I come in where the arc stops, another half a module. Not half a module. Half of a six, so a twelfth of a module. And then I draw my my uh, cove molding in. And so what I need to do is lay out the little square once more that that cove is going to be in. It's filleted cove, really. Here's the other pinprick that I made for the square earlier. And really, I'm just going to have an upside down image of this up here. So the same molding profile. And that's, for a simple design, that's still a nice thing to do because I'm probably going to end up having to make it with some molding planes rather than using off-the-shelf materials, even though it's a fairly simple one to get it in the right size. I'm guessing I'm going to have to do that. So, let's just strike that arc. That. It's almost an amazing coincidence. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, the center for the arc that I'm drawing 
almost coincided for the, with the center of the arc down here, but not quite. Clean up some of the stray marks on these. This is the top. Oh, I guess I need to draw the edge of the fillet in on the top, the top crown molding. There we go. Ordinarily I would try to write a little bit more neatly, but Cognizant of time here. And then this is our pedestal. The other thing to keep in mind about our pedestal is that, um, let's see, one, two, three, four. So this point right here, one, two, three, four steps in, is where our elliptical arcs that are right here would start to come in. So that's not going to show up on this this page. My drawing is not wide enough to accommodate that. But I don't think we need to draw in the elliptical arcs on this because we've already indicated that the major axis is two-thirds of a module long and the minor axis is, two, is one quarter of a module high. That's something we could construct at full scale later on. All right, so now we've got a detailed view of our moldings. And then the smaller scale view of the overall casework itself. And that's really about it for this design. Um, there's, there's really nothing else to, to fill in for it. One thing I didn't mean to point out when I was drawing the um, side and front elevation views is that the back plane here is really one plane. So I don't have the pedestal molding wrapping all the way around the back. And that's just so it will fit flat up against a wall or if I were to put this under um, a, a loft bed and fit flat up against the framing of, uh, of the bed and maybe even be uh, in a, way, a place where I could accommodate an attachment of it to the bed so that it you know doesn't tip over when somebody opens up the top drawer and starts hanging on it like a wild monkey. Um, so that's that's, that's really it for this, this refinement of the existing design that we saw earlier. And you, know, you can see that it, it really changes the look and feel of it um, and gives it you know, quite a bit more visual appeal. It is at the cost of some space, um, some both width and height of these drawers, but not a lot. I mean, um, if I were to measure the width of the drawer fronts, just do a little experiment here on the old design. Yeah, they're about two inches in, in full scale. They're about two inches narrower in this and then as far as the height goes, I don't know if I'm going to be able to open up that far with this compass. Maybe. The overall height of the drawer bays. Uh, I'm just barely going to make it. There we go. So I just measured it off of the old design. Same thing, you know, we lose maybe an inch to an inch and a half in overall height. So for stylistic changes, 
We've sacrificed a little bit of storage volume, but really not a lot. So I think that's going to be it for this phase of the design workshop, and uh, we'll start over with uh, another design next. You might recall in the second design workshop that I laid out fairly simple bookcase again with very rectangular uh, design elements to it, not really any ornamentation at all, just to be a functional bookcase that would fit underneath a, um, a lofted bed. Um, really the main critical dimension was its height. I didn't want it to, um, I didn't certainly didn't want it to exceed uh, 60 inches, probably didn't want it to approach 60 inches because that was the max ceiling height under this, this lofted bed. So um, I made it so that the main critical dimension, the height was 59 inches and um, you know the all of the other dimensions were uh, proportionally related to that. Rather than going through the redesign and refinement process for that bookcase, um, on camera anyway, I've just gone ahead and drawn it because it is not going to add too much in the way of design concepts that we haven't already seen. Really the only refinements to this bookcase are quite similar to the refinements that we saw with the, the dresser, the chest of drawers. Um, I put a top on the bookcase that stood proud of its width and depth, a little piece of crown molding under the top, and then it sits on a pedestal with a little bit of baseboard molding on top of the pedestal. Um, that has caused the overall width of the shelf itself to uh, decrease. I went from the full uh, width in the old design to give this this thing a waste. Um, it would have also caused the depth to decrease and I didn't really want to give up much depth in case there were any larger format books, especially going under the bottom shelf, that needed that kind of depth. So rather than sticking with the overall depth to width ratio of one to three from the previous incarnation of this design, I just used two of these modular steps, which are one-eighth of the overall height. So it gave me a little extra depth to play with since I was losing that depth with the, um, the bump out of the, uh, the molding on both the top and the bottom. And, uh, you know, I'm also functionally losing depth because there will be the inset backboards on, on this, th this case as well. So um, really the depth is only going to be about from here to here, which still, um, you know, I was looking to shoot for anywhere from 10 to 12 inches of depth, storage depth, and that still has me in that range. So, uh, other features that I've retained, well, the other feature that I've retained from that previous design is that the drawer or the, the shelf bays between dividers are still in, um, they're continuously proportional in a ratio of seven to six from top to the bottom. All right, so I didn't really see the need to go through and do a step-by-step -step process of how this design would have been laid out because it's it's really rather similar to what we would have seen on the um, the, uh, the chest of drawers. Uh, if I was going to carefully design this, I'd probably do some close-up views of the baseboard and crown molding that goes around uh, this bookcase, but there's re really not much else that I'd need to do other than maybe some um, exploded views of some of the internal construction uh, details. Um, again, depending on your experience with building things like this, it might be useful to have that or it might be just fine to wing it as you are building it because it's not really winging it if you've done it before.
Well, the last, last part of this final design workshop for this initial uh, geometry and design series is um, not really a complete design at all. It's, it's, um, it's a start at a design for just a display shelf. And, um, you know, really the main reason I'm doing it is to have an excuse to incorporate a, a um, gothic or lancet arch, uh, in this case it's going to be a gothic arch, into a design. And so um, this really isn't meant to be a bookshelf. It's going to have two frames on the side with shelves spanning between them, supported. Um, and so on the, on the side view, um, we can see that the shelves uh, poke through two vertical posts. This is the edge of the shelf right here. And then there's a, um, um, a stretcher and supporting the shelf as it pokes through this frame. And um, I, this stretcher here on the front elevation view that has the arch relief cut into it, that's just going to, you know, once again, tie into these side stretchers uh, with a few through tenants. None of that is anything that's overly complicated to design, I guess. Um, like I said, I, what I really wanted to do is just use this as a, as a vehicle for incorporating a, a gothic arch into the design. And where I want this gothic arch to be is that I'd like these vertical side frames to start to curve at the top and meet at a point you know, as a gothic arch. Do the same on the back, back edge. And then a smaller one on the inside so that it looks like it's just a bent piece of constant thickness material. So I've got some constraints. I want the outer edge of the arch to start right here. So here's my baseline for that one. And I want it to meet at this apex up here. So I know that I want the arch to have a vertical tangent line right here, so this baseline is a place where the center will be. And I want the arch to end up here, so really what I need to do to find where along this, this baseline my center is, is that my, my usual technique of taking the segment that connects the endpoints of the arc and find its perpendicular bisector. So let's go ahead and do that. So put my compass set to the length of that segment that I'm wanting. And I'm gonna, whoop, I think I just messed it all up. That still feels good. So I'm gonna do my double. Um, equilateral triangle construction to find the perpendicular bisector of that segment. Then I'll connect those two cross marks. And really I just need to find where it intersects my baseline, which is right here. And That's a way I can get an arc terminates up there at the top, and yet has a vertical vertical tangent at the edge. Now, rather than trying to go and find the center on the other side, I'm just going to use symmetry, put the marking tip where I want it to start on the back edge of this frame, and the other tip on my baseline, and everything should line up pretty well. And yeah, it basically does. There we go. So we've got this Gothic arch profile, but now I need to get another one that's coming up. And what I'd really like to do is get it so that the thickness is uniform 
across this 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 profile if I if I trace out another gothic arch in uh, on the inside of the outer one. And to do that, I can't I can't just draw another one that starts here and ends up here at the midpoint somehow. Um, that's not going to work. I mean, I can try it. You know, basically use the same radius. And what we're going to see is that it gets skinny at the top. So that's no good. What I need to do is find a place to locate my, my center for this interior arc so that it's not on my original baseline, but it's below it, so that my arc still starts at this point, but ends somewhere somewhere from somewhere along the line that connects the apex to my original center. So I'll go ahead and draw that line. I'll draw it in a little darker. So that, because that, that ray that I just drew is, it's where this curving arc ends, angularly speaking. So if I take the width of this piece of material at its base, transfer it up here from the apex along that angular line, then this is where I want my new arc, my interior arc, to stop. And so what I need to do is turn my compass around from that point and swing an arc. What's going on down here? And then, where do I start? Well, keeping the same radius, swing that arc. So, those two arcs intersect. So my new center, notice it's below the baseline that I had before. And it allows me to swing this gothic arch, arc half, that keeps this to be basically a constant width. Now, I know that's a little bit hard to see maybe at this scale. So I am going to repeat the process. So here is the center. I just drew an X through it that I use to draw the exterior of this arc on the right. All right. So I'm going to draw a straight line from the apex of my gothic arch to that center. Basically what I'm wanting is to have a new center down here somewhere below the original baseline so that if my arc starts at this point here, at the top of the frame, it's going to end somewhere along this line a distance from the apex that's equal to the thickness of the material that I'm building this, this frame out of. And so the way I find that center so that I take my compass, whose radius has not changed yet, poke it in that hole on the diagonal that is frame material's distance from the apex, swing an arc down below my baseline, and then the other arc goes from where I want the starting point of my got interior gothic arch to be. I just look for where the two intersect. That's going to ensure that this interior starting arc starts and ends in the correct place. Now I've got some overlap up here. 
that I can now erase along with a bunch of other marks that I don't need. What I'm going to be left with besides a bunch of eraser smudges. is this shelf frame that has a gothic arch at its peak. Darken some lines. There we go. And so this peak would probably have to be joined from two pieces. So we'll mark that in apex to apex. There's probably a joint there, but there we go. There's, there's one practical way you could incorporate a Gothic arch into a somewhat more modern looking piece of furniture. In this case, this would just be a, a display shelf. I don't know that I'd put books on it because I've got these cross braces underneath the shelves that would kind of block where they could go. But it would be a good place for storing, you know, wooden bowls or pottery or something that you just wanted to display in a in a room. Um, this is probably a design that could stand some more um, refinement and, and and thought, but. You know, I wanted to, since we learned about Gothic arches, I wanted to include one in a design, especially in this sort of constrained way where I already had a width and a height of a space that I could fit the thing into. And then I wanted to make sure that I had both an inner and a uh, outer arc on both sides of the Gothic arch that maintained the thickness of the material um, across its its entire path. So it's possibly a design element you could find uh, a use for in some of your own work. That really brings us to the end of of the um, the third design workshop for the geometry and design series. And now it's really your turn to go off and start trying to add some curved design elements in um, you know, a tasteful way that's going to enhance and possibly um, lighten up some of, some of your own designs. And so good luck. <laughs>